Greetings, everyone. Today is a very special broadcast from back in 2009. It is my interview with the late Christopher Kennedy Lawford. On March 29th, 1955, Christopher Kennedy Lawford was born and unfortunately passed away on September 4th, 2018. He was an American actor, author, and activist. He was a member of the prominent Kennedy family and son of actor Peter Lawford and Patricia Pat Kennedy Lawford, who was the sister of President John F. Kennedy. He graduated from Tufts University in 1977 and earned a law degree from Boston College in 1983. He later earned a master's certificate in clinical psychology from Harvard University and was a lecturer on drug addiction. After struggling with addiction for 17 years, he became an actor, performing in several movies and television shows for over 20 years. He wrote several books based on his own experience about addiction and recovery. He also traveled around the United States speaking about his experiences with addiction for 20 years and was a public health campaigner, working with the United Nations and for the U.S. federal government. The following is a broadcast of my interview with one of the most influential advocates and fellow members of the recovery community. I will always be grateful for the opportunity to interview Mr. Christopher Kennedy Lawford. The views expressed on the following broadcast do not necessarily reflect those of KHLT, Take 12 Radio, or our affiliates. The opinions on this show should not be considered as medical, psychological, or professional advice and are those of the host, co-host, and guest. Take 12 Radio and KHLT Recovery Broadcasting are not affiliated with any particular 12-step fellowship. Welcome to the Take 12 Recovery Radio Show. I am your host, the Monty Man, with this very special broadcast from the best of Take 12 Recovery Radio. My guest on the show, Mr. Christopher Kennedy Lawford, coming up right now. Just don't drink. Walk, walk if you're ready. This is the place. I have a special treat for you from the best of Take 12 Recovery Radio from back in 2009, my interview with Christopher Kennedy Lawford. This is the son of actor Peter Lawford, uh, the nephew of John F. Kennedy, and good friend to many in Hollywood. Uh, His book, which we're going to talk about, deals with interviews from many folks. We're going to be talking about Alec Baldwin, We're going to be talking about Jack Kennedy uh, and primarily talking about Christopher Kennedy Lawford's story of experience, strength, and hope. What a privilege it was to have him on Take 12 Recovery Radio back in 2009. So without further ado, here is that interview with my guest, Christopher Kennedy Lawford. Today, my guest is Christopher Kennedy Lawford. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Uh, Chris was born in Santa Monica, California, the son of actor Peter Lawford and Pat Kennedy. He's a nephew of John F. Kennedy and cousin-in-law of Arnold Schwarzenegger. 
And uh, he is, well, here's his education, uh, Bachelor of Arts in Tufts University, a JD from Boston College Law School, Master's Certificate uh, in Clinical Psychology from Harvard Medical School, where he gained an academic appointment as a lecturer in psychiatry. Uh, for much of his adult life, uh, Chris uh, has battled drug, drug and alcohol addiction, like many of us. And today he has been sober for more than two decades. He has participated in public speaking appearances throughout the United States and the world with politicians, nonprofit and educational organizations, and the recovery movement. In his own life, he has, uh, he has led him on a path of self-discovery, intense therapy, personal growth, and eventually to be an advocate for additional treatment and recovery. He seeks to empower people to understand addiction as a disease and to help make a difference in their communities. His story is about asking questions, searching for the truth, and finding courage no matter the consequences. My friends, uh, let me introduce you to my guest, Christopher Kennedy Lawford. Chris, welcome to the show. All right, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. It, it, it is so, uh, it's such an honor to have you, and, and I, I, I've been following you for uh, a while now, and have read your book, and have been looking at your YouTube presentations and so forth. You're a funny guy. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. I, uh, <laughs> I've, uh, I don't think I've got a career as a comedian, at least not yet, but I'm, I'm working on it. Now, now be before we talk, and I, I want to boast on you just a little bit, before we talk about your, your story, um... Some of your acting credentials are uh, Eavesdrop and Slipstream and, and The World's Fastest Indian, Terminator 3, Blank Men, The Doors, The Russia House. And you had a three-year tenure on All My Children, right? I did. Yeah. So, I did, I did. So, so you sound like a pretty successful guy. What happened, man? What was going on? Well, you know, I, I mean, my story is a lot like a lot, a lot of us. I'm 53 years old, so I grew up at the tail end of the 60s. I... I started using drugs and alcohol when I was 12, like a lot of folks back then. Yeah. And uh, you know, my, my new book, Moments of Clarity, I, I interview a lot of folks that are that are that are my that are contemporaries of mine. And, and the story is one of you know, people ask me all the time, you know, where my addiction came from. I started using when I was 12. I stopped when I was 30. I had a moment of clarity, and I've been clean and sober ever since, over 22 years. So. My my story is one of I think I have the genetics. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think also in 1969 when I began my drug use, you know, it was an entirely different culture back then. Uh, we, you know, we had no idea what some of the downside. I mean, cocaine was not addictive. Uh, you know, they, it was it was it was pretty much uh, the, the the experimentation and ethic back then was about sort of expanding your mind and sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And then I also had the additional, uh, you know, emotional aspects of, of my life, which were I sort of, uh, I had witnessed the assassination of two of my family members, my two uncles, and my parents were divorced when I was eight years old. And so I was, you know, I had a certain amount of trauma growing up, which we now know, uh, you know, a, a kid who suffers some grave emotional trauma at the age of 13 is much more likely to, to choose a path involving drugs and alcohol. So that's my story. I picked up drugs and alcohol when I was 12. I was also, but I was a very functional uh, drug addict. I went to, you know, college, law school. I even got a master's certification from, from Harvard in clinical psychology with an emphasis in addictive behavior while fully immersed in my active addiction. <laughs> like many of us, you know, the outside had to look good. I was dying on the inside, but as long as the outside looked good, we were cool. Oh, yeah, of course. And I was talking to an old college friend of mine. He said, I remember, Monty, when, when you and Fred and Adolph would go and sing in, in, uh, at, at the different churches, um, and someone else would this too. It was a quartet. And then you would leave and take the love offering, and after you would get done with the concert, you guys would go out and get pizza and beer and get swacked. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so the look good was always there. You say uh, in your book, you say I was desperately trying to control my usage so that I could function a little bit and not be completely physically dependent. That's interesting. Well, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I vacillated a lot. I, you know, I tried to control my drug use for many, many years. I, yeah. I knew I, when I was 21 years old, I was at Georgetown University. I'd gone there basically to, to study uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald and, and Thomas Jefferson as an American studies major. And I, unfortunately, I moved in next door to a commune of heroin addicts, and that was sort of the end of Jefferson and Fitzgerald and hello to emergency rooms and police stations. But I knew at the age of 21 that I had a problem, and I tried for nine years 
to arrest that problem. And I tried everything. I was a very, I had a lot of resources at my disposal. I was very committed to try to do something about my problem. And, and as, as many of us know, you, no human power could relieve my, my addiction. Right. And uh, so I tried, you know, controlling my drug use. I tried therapy. I tried locking myself in a room. I tried geographics. I tried going to graduate school. I tried changing girlfriends and nothing worked until February 17th, 1986 when I had what, what I call sort of a moment of clarity or spiritual epiphany or what Carl Jung called a psychic change moment or what Bill Wilson called a change of heart. Sure, sure. And, and you, you talk about how you just weren't willing to let go for so long, right? Well, you know, that, that's not true. I, I, I don't know that I wasn't willing to let go. I don't think I was capable of letting capable. go. Capable, okay. I, I was willing to do anything. I just didn't know how. And I... I think with most people that suffer from this illness, the reason I became an advocate, I, I didn't write my book, uh, my first book, Symptoms of Withdrawal, to become an advocate in the field of, of substance abuse I, or chemical dependency. I, I wrote that book as a piece of writing, and I, you know, I, and my second book was a, is a novel that, I, that I'm trying to write now because I got hij hijacked into this book on recovery, but I, I didn't really want to be an advocate. I, I, until I got sober... Until I wrote that book and started going around the country and realized that there are 26 million Americans that suffer from some kind of, uh, you know, substance abuse disorder, and if and if you and if you if you count the number of people that are directly impacted by those 26 million of people, uh, Americans, there's probably 100, 150 million people in this country who are da uh, adversely affected by addiction on a, on a daily basis. 85% of the people, of the 2 million people behind bars in this country, have a, hit, have a chronic history of drug and alcohol. I mean, this, this, is a, this is the number one public health crisis facing the United States, according to the federal government, and very little resources are committed to it. Um, we, we, you know, we spend a lot of money on interdiction and not enough money on treatment, education, or prevention. And so my job now is to get out there and sort of talk about this thing and keep it on, the, keep it on our radar so that when... President Obama attacks the health crisis in this country that we're at the table. You you say that uh, you had no idea that you schedule a business meeting. I love this. You schedule a business meeting and you show up. You get a part in a movie and you show up. Even if you're terrified, even if you're afraid, you'll fail. Even if you do fail, you show up. Did Christopher Kennedy Lawford show up when he was supposed to or were you doing the vanishing act? Well, I mean, you know, when I was using, uh, I, I, I had a hard time showing up. I remember when I, I was trying to get off drugs and alcohol, I was living in Boston, and I would, I would have my girlfriend at the time lock me in a room uh, in that apartment, lock me in that apartment when she went off and went to work, and I would watch uh, from this little uh, window in that apartment the people walking by outside in, they, in their suits with their briefcases and their, and their nice dresses and their handbags, and I would wonder how they did it how they engage mm. life on life's terms. And mm -hmm. I, because clearly I couldn't do it, even though I had accomplished all these things, I wasn't really there. I wasn't really present in my life. Once I got sober, I, got, I had the opportunity to, to engage my life, to show up on a daily basis for life on life's terms, no matter how I feel. And that's the great gift, because once you've been to the depths that addicts and alcoholics have been to, you, you can't really have that bad of a day. So even if you're embarrassed on a set or you don't, you forget your lines or, or you don't really know what they're talking about in a particular meeting or whatever, um, I show up and eventually I get it. You know, um, today I know how to handle situations which used to baffle me. Right. I know how to do things that I had no idea that I could do and I've had a life beyond my wildest dreams. And the greatest gift of recovery really is what, you know, is, is what Joseph Campbell said, which is basically the privilege of a lifetime is being who you are. And, and in recovery, you get to really realize who you are. Yeah, yeah. A amen. Good word, my friend. That's great. Now, uh, the, you came to a place in your life. Uh, you say that you went to your mother's apartment and you were humiliated and you were terrified, but you got on your knees and you asked for this thing to be removed. And you say it was. You say it wasn't immediate, but within the next couple of months, it was gone. Um, some people that, you know, it's kind of a controversial issue with some folks uh, in recovery. You know, there's people that say, well, I'm in recovery. There's people that say I'm recovered. There's people that say, oh, it's just a matter of semantics. What do you mean by it was gone? 
Well, you know, I, I've, I've written a book about uh, called Moments of Clarity, which is a book about spiritual epiphanies. And for me, uh, my, my, my recovery definitely has a spiritual component to it, which basically means it's not a religious thing. It just means that there's something happened inside of me and in my life that I can't really explain by using terms that are associated with this world. Um, mm-hmm. My life works today because of a power that's in my life that I don't really understand. I don't really question. I just utilize. There, there are people in moments of clarity that are atheistic. Um, they don't really believe in a God, but they, but they have something that's bigger than them that works for them in their life, whether it's a group of people or, or a light bulb. It doesn't really matter as long as you have faith that there's something uh, that, that, will, that will sustain you and and give you some sort of guidance uh, when you're confronted with the with the baffling nature of life on life's terms. You got and that's, and so for me, when I when I when I hit my knees, when some guy said to me when I was walking around New York City trying to be an actor, and I was going on these auditions, and all of these uh, drugstore signs and bar signs were screaming at my new sobriety with a vengeance, and I I needed I needed something to help me with that, and a guy a guy a spiritual mentor of mine. In early recovery, he said, throw your shoes under the bed. And I said, what are you talking about? He goes, throw your shoes under the bed and get on your knees and ask a power greater than you to remove the obsession to use drugs and alcohol. And I did that in my mother's apartment. I didn't think it would work. I felt stupid. I felt weak. But I did because that's how desperate I was. And within 60 days, the obsession that had vanquished me for 17 years, which would not enable me to not use drugs and alcohol for one single day, unless I was locked up somewhere, vanished, and it hasn't returned for 22 years. That is a miracle. I don't care what you call it. It happened to me in my life. It's happened for thousands and thousands of other people. It is miraculous. I don't know what it is. I don't get into the controversy of it. I don't care what other people believe. That's what I believe. A guy once said to me in early sobriety, he goes, you could prove to me that God doesn't exist, and I would still believe in him because it works for me. And that's the only thing that I do. I could care less what people think or what they believe or what they don't believe. It works for me. Sure, sure. Yeah. Christopher Kennedy Lawford is my guest today. Uh, Chris, this is, a, this is a book that is filled uh, with well-known people. And it, it seems like, you know, there was a time when recovery, it almost sounded like it was becoming a fad. I mean, every time you turned on a talk show, uh, somebody was in recovery, somebody was bipolar, somebody was this, somebody was that. Um, But those times seem to have changed, and people are taking it a whole lot more seriously, and more and more people are opening up and telling their story. Now, listeners, uh, just just some of the people, just a few of them, there's lots of people in here, uh, interviews uh, that Chris has conducted with Jim Vance, Alec Baldwin, Judy Collins, Ed Bagby Jr., Kelly McGillis, Richard Dreyfuss, uh, uh, you've got Tom Arnold, Jamie Lee Curtis, Lou Gossett Jr., Katie Segal, Jim Ramstead, Martin Sheen, and the list goes on and on. Uh, it wasn't as easy as you thought getting interviews, though, was it? No, it was, it was difficult. This is a difficult issue to talk about, and one of the reasons I, I do uh, go around the country talking about uh, the, the, the issue of addiction and recovery is because uh, of the stigma associated with, with this illness. Um, this is a mental illness. It's been classified as such. It is right. a, uh, it is a, it is, it is, it needs to be, it needs to be talked about that way. One of the folks in this book is a guy named Max Cleland who does not identify as an alcoholic or an addict. He does not drink anymore. But Max, I put in the book because, you know, he suffered from, from depression, which is obviously for many alcoholics and addicts is one of the underlying uh, causes and conditions, and and he was also, a, you know, he had gone to Vietnam, and he he had been in country for about uh, for for a very short period of time, and he got off a helicopter, and he bent down to pick up a grenade, and then it exploded and blew up both of his legs and one of his arms, and and he recovered from that, and he became uh, under Jimmy Carter the Secretary of uh, Veterans Affairs, and he became a United States Senator from the state of Georgia. And he lost his, his subsequent election to that, the United States Senate. And he went into such a deep depression that he told me, and he says it in this book, he said, you know, that depression from that loss was far worse than having to overcome getting your legs and your arms blown off. Mm. So if anybody thinks mental illness or addiction is for, is for pussies, they ought to talk to Max Cleland. And, yeah. you know, this is, not, this is a really serious illness. 
it needs to be addressed as such. And the people in this book talk about their, their moment of clarity because people in this country need hope. They need to believe that they can change their lives. That your, your listeners, most of them are probably in recovery, and they get a message of hope, and they get a message of change every day. But most of the people out there are not getting that message, and hopefully this book will help. That's, that's right. They're not. Um, in talking with Jim Ramsed uh, here last year, uh, we... Boy, he was really pushing the advocacy thing and uh, uh, faces and voices of recovery and jointogether.org and so forth. Um, how can how can people out there um, join an advocacy program? Is there is there lots of them? Well, there, there, there are a few. I mean, you know, voice, uh, faces and voices is a great one. The uh, uh, the partnership for drug free America does some interesting work. There's lots of groups out there of people that are trying to make a difference. I mean, the problem is is that as a constituency. We are not. We are not mobilized. We are not organized. We are not. Uh, we, we we are not really active as a as a you know. And the only way things get changed, and the only way state legislators or federal legislators pay attention to anything, is if their jobs are on the line. And and the only way their jobs are on the line is if they go back to their districts and people are going, "What are you doing about the parity bill?" What are you doing about, you know, money for dollars for treatment and prevention and education? And what, what are we doing spending all this money sending, uh, sending, folks, sending folks to jail uh, and not, you know, and not rehabilitating them? Why aren't we, why are drug courts, uh, you know, uh, are more prevalent? I mean, because they've got excellent rates of recidivism in drug courts, and yet the many, many communities don't listen to them, don't, don't, don't utilize them. Yeah. The reason for that is because as a as a constituency, the recovering community hasn't found its voice and it hasn't found its 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 uh, mojo, if you will. Do, and, and people need to get involved. Do you think, Chris? Do you think that part of that problem, though, has been the fear that is behind some of the anonymity uh, traditions and so forth of some groups? You know, Bill Wilson, who started Alcoholics Anonymous, which is probably, I mean, if you look at all different organizations and, and treatment facilities and everything that, that have helped people with this, I mean, AA, as the guy said, uh, who was the head of the uh, uh, American Psychiatric Association in the 50s, he said Alcoholics Anonymous is the most significant social invention since Christ. And what he meant, what he meant by that was that, that that organization has helped more people. And they have a tradition of anonymity in Alcoholics Anonymous in all 12-step programs. Now, that tradition basically says you cannot identify as a member of AA or any of those 12-step programs and use your last name or have your picture taken for uh, full frontal photography. It doesn't say that you can't go out and talk about recovery. As a matter of fact, Bill Wilson, who started AA, testified in front of the United States Senate in front of a subcommittee by Harold Hughes, and he basically said that AA's should go out and talk about being sober and being recovered. They just shouldn't talk about being an Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, right. I wrote a book of 44 people. None of those people talk about being in any 12-step program. Nobody says any of those people are in 12-step programs. They talk about having it, having an illness and being in recovery and how that happened for them. Yeah. Um, and, and you can easily do that. The people in 12-step programs that start jumping up and down about the traditions if they're, you know, they, they probably don't know what the tradition is, and they haven't really educated themselves about it. There are people out there who do talk about being an AA, and they're wrong to do that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's you, you not bet. what we're talking about, though, in terms of mobilizing, a, a, you know, the, a grassroots organization of the, of the millions of Americans who are in recovery to go out and, and advocate for themselves. They don't have to talk about what they do or where they, or where they get sober. Right. Right. And, and, and really, as so many people are going to pretty much figure that out on their own without them doing that anyway. Um, but you're right. Lots of people in these fellowships don't know their history. They don't know. Really, they don't read the books. They maybe maybe they read the main book, the basic text of whatever program they're in. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I got educated on the whole anonymity thing by reading Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers and finding what it really meant. And I was shocked. I was like, wow, I've got a lot of freedom to talk about recovery. Right, absolutely. Most people don't know. And, it, and if you would ask me, I would have said the same thing five years ago. Yeah. I would have, if somebody had come to me and asked me to be in a book called Moments of Clarity five years ago, I would have said no. 
because I, I was under the misguided assumption that 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 I that I, if I'm in recovery, I should keep my mouth shut. Now, I don't, I don't, I don't disagree that there's some people. Like there was a guy who I interviewed for my book, who was a, a pretty famous musician in Nashville, actually, who is sober a long time, and he he he. I did a great interview with him, and he said at the end of the thing, he said, "You know what? I can't, I can't do this." He goes, "My story is for the guys I work with." One on one, and I, I don't want to put it out in the book. For I think it'll it'll dilute it, and I can't say that he's wrong. You know, the great the great thing about Alcoholics Anonymous, from what I understand, is that that organization is is built on the fact of one one drunk holding his hand out to another drunk. That's right. And and you know that's a very powerful thing. And I, and if those folks don't believe that going out and talking about their stuff in a bigger in a bigger venue is useful. I can't disagree with them. Sure, but sure. There, there's room for everybody here. In, in your book, uh, you you mentioned the fact that the the first person that you asked to be a, a part of this was Alec Baldwin. Yeah. Did did he was he all for it in the beginning? Did he did he pull out like a couple of them did? What did he do? No, he actually didn't. He had said no to me at first, and uh, and because he didn't really want it, he didn't really want to talk. I mean, Alec does a lot of work politically and socially, and I just don't think he wanted to, to to start another front, you know, in terms of stuff that he talks about, and I totally respected that. Yeah. I asked him again about six months later, because I really wanted him to be in the book, and I was with him, and I've known him for a long time, and he agreed to do it, and he did it to, He did it as a favor to me, I think, more than anything. I don't think he wanted to do it. I think he did it as a favor for me, to me, and I'm enormously grateful, because I think his story is enormously powerful, and obviously... He's he's brought the book a lot of attention, and I you know I told him the other day that I that if he ever runs for governor, I'll go to Buffalo for three months for him and <laughs> and, and, uh, and work for him up there in the middle of winter. Now, okay, here, here's kind of a question that kind of pins you to the wall, and I don't know if it's really a fair question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Is there any one particular story or a couple in here uh, that is your favorite? Um, let's see. I loved I loved Jim Vance's story. Because I, I, I didn't know Jim, I didn't know his story, and I just found it to be unbelievably powerful. And I think his, the way he talks about, uh, about uh, you know, his wanting to die in, a, in more spectacularly than his father, and the, the absolute, the, I just, I just love his story. I find it to be powerful and 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 gritty and just honest and and succinct. Um, I love Steve Earle and Earl Hightower. I think those two guys are so smart about recovery and they, they know their stuff so well and they're so they're so smart. I mean they're just so smart. And Jamie Lee Curtis was another one that I just because I've known her my whole life and I never knew her story and I just her she is so dedicated to recovery and so uh, and again another person who's so smart and so filled with love and service. I all of the stories are amazing to me, but though I think those yeah. four were Probably four of my favorites, but they're all just remarkable. Now, now, uh, not to get too far away from the whole recovery thing, it, as, as you even say in the book, but it, but I've, I've got to bring this up. You bring it up. I think it's it's a great story. Elaine Stritz said, uh, she said, uh, oh, by by the way, Chris, I had two dates with your uncle Jack. Did you know that? I was nineteen. <laughs> I was nineteen years old. How did you react when she told you that? Oh, I loved it. Elaine, I, I want Elaine to write her book because, I mean, she's done her one-woman show, which is sort of autobiographical, but she has some of the greatest stories I've ever heard. I mean, she and that story about my Uncle Jack was so great. I loved it. it, I loved it. it, it this is so awesome. Uh, it really speaks to the integrity of your uncle. Is it, the first date was my idea. I saw him at a cocktail party, as they say, across a crowded room, some enchanted evening. You had better believe me. I noticed that he was about to leave the party, and Chris, he was so adorable. You want to know what I did? After two martinis, it wasn't difficult. I uh, just up and asked him where he was going, just for a bite at the Carlisle up the street, a little Bobby Short, and then home, I guess. Is it okay if I come with you, she said, and Jack Kennedy said, why in the world not? Fine with me. And the second date, she says, was a glorious evening at the Stork Club, she says, we got back uh, to my apartment on 52nd Street, and I invited your Uncle Jack up to uh, or up for a nightcap. Elaine uh, 
uh, he said, if going up to your apartment and having a nightcap means having scrambled eggs and listening to Glenn Miller records, then I will have to say no. She says, I was very young and very inexperienced, if you know what I mean, but I knew exactly what he was talking about. Well, I said, I guess that is what was on my mind. He kissed me goodnight, turned me over to the doorman, and back in his limo, made a U-turn on East 52nd Street and drove off into the night. I got into my elevator, and I remember saying to myself going up, what a straight shooter. I'll bet the house that he is definitely, and without a doubt, going places. What a compliment. What a, what a thing to speak to your uncle's integrity. Yeah, it was great. I, yeah, he, he, uh, I was a great story, and she's a great, great woman. I'm so glad she's in moments of clarity. And it was just, it was, it was one of the, it was one of those little gifts that I got in doing this book. That I, and I got a lot of them. It was really uh, special. This is this is really excellent. Uh, I've enjoyed it. I know many of the listeners will enjoy it as well. How can people get a hold of this? Well, it's all over the bookstores, hopefully. I'm sure it's all over Albany and Portland up there in the bookstores. But you can get it online, obviously, at uh, you know Barnes & Noble or Amazon. And and, uh, and if anybody likes the book, write a review. Good, good. We'll do that. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll get on there and write a review from Take 12 Radio. Uh, Absolutely. Right. Yeah. You, you bet. No, it's, been, it's been great because, you know, everybody in recovery has really come out and, and supported the book. It's been a really... Uh, it's it's been great in that regard. I mean, I you know, as you said, you take your you take a few shots from some of the folks that you know just don't don't think we should be talking about this stuff out in the real world. But for the most part, everybody's really out there supporting the book, and it's and it's you know it's it's meaningful in people's lives. That's that's the whole point of this thing, and and it gives me a chance to you know to go on programs like yours, which you do a great job, Monty, just getting the word out and talking about this thing in terms of of it as a disease, which is, and, and, and to just, you know, to, to keep this in people's minds, you know, addicts and alcoholics are not bad people doing bad things. They're sick people who are trying to get better. And, and this is the way we got to look at this thing. Absolutely. Ah, that's good. Good stuff. And I, I'm just so glad that you're doing this. I am even uh, more just, you know, it's what a hoot that you are alive and well and serving your fellow man it's it just speaks to all sorts of gratitude for our creator. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's miraculous. I mean, God kept me alive for some reason, and I'm uh, I'm really grateful for it. Yeah. All right, Christopher, can we have you back on the show sometime in the future? Anytime, man. I'm around. I'd love to do it. Uh, love that, to do it. That would that would be great. Awesome. I really appreciate you coming on. And uh, any last words for those who are listening? Well, just you know, uh, a day at a time. You know, that's the that's the that's the. Uh, that's the trick, a day at a time, and uh, we're, you know, our, our, our code is love and service, so yeah, there you go. Yeah, good, good. Well, there you have it. That was our interview with Christopher Kennedy Lawford back in 2009. Listen, over the last 16 years, we have had the privilege of interviewing many actors, clinicians, authors, and the ordinary folk like you and I in recovery or advocates of recovery on this show, the Take 12 Recovery radio show. I want to say a special thank you to all of our guests over the years, all of our co-hosts, and a very, very intense thank you to those of you who have helped to financially sponsor this show over the last 16 years. If you are interested in becoming a Take 12 Recovery radio sponsor and partner, please email me at take12radio, that's take the number 12, radio at comcast.net. Also, if you'd like to donate, no amount is too small to keep us on the air, visit us at take12radio.com. Scroll down to the bottom left of the page, and there you'll find a donate button where you can set up reoccurring donations uh, or a one-time gift. Like I said, no amount's too small. We appreciate you so much. All right. A special thank you to my guest, Christopher Kennedy Lawford, and to all of you for tuning in until our next broadcast. This is the Monty Man, and I am wishing God's perfect serenity for you. Come on in. This has been a broadcast of KHLT Recovery Broadcasting. This is a play.
Kitty, 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 kitty. Meow, meow, meow. Woof, woof. 